welcome to Hoffman's Hunting Heritage. Load your quiver, camo up, and join us for another great episode of Outdoors Action. Here is your host, Bill Hoffman. And welcome back to another thrilling episode of Hoffman's Hunting Heritage. I'm your host, Bill Hoffman, and this week's guest I've got joining here on a Skype call. We're face-to-face videoing it up. Of course, you guys are just going to get to enjoy the audio. The one, the only, Mr. Jacob Hacker. I love everything about this man, except for the fact that he's an Ohio State Buckeye. What's going on, my brother? What's up, Billy? Dude, this is the first time we've recorded a podcast and seen each other while we were going, except for the one we did together live, but this is weird. (laughs) <laughs> I got to get used to this. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, you know, we, we, with the new podcast going up and stepping up into the world, I, it's not necessary to really be able to see each other, but I do think it, it adds an element, especially with people that if you know each other really well, because, you know, you can crack jokes and, you know, do all the things that we're, uh, we're known to do over the course of a podcast. And you guys that don't know Jake, uh, he, uh, was a frequent visitor on season one of Hoffman's Hunting Heritage. That's basically what we're calling the old show, season one. This isn't season two. It's just a continuation of season one. <laughs> and I figure in TV shows, in TV shows, sometimes they have reruns, right? So, uh, it's part two. What's that? It's part two of season one. Season one, part two. Yeah, right. Part two, season one. Uh, so anyway, for those of you guys that aren't familiar, he is one of my best friends in the outdoors hunting world. He's an absolutely fantastic outdoorsman. Uh, he works in the industry. Of course, we'll talk about that eventually one day. Dude's been to Africa a bunch. We'll get all those stories out. And uh, But what he's referring to is him and I did a live podcast a few Novembers ago. And, uh, unfortunately that year, uh, and every year since I had lost a bet with him on the Michigan, Ohio state game in which the loser has to wear the other person's other team's Jersey for a picture and their Facebook profile. So that was the first year where we had a impromptu photo shoot, but that's going to change. That's going to change this year. Cause my Wolverines are going to get it done. Well, it will actually change next year because this year you have to wear, the Dwayne Haskins jersey for a week in November. So, okay, the, he is he is correct. But I, they, yeah, but next we'll next year it'll be see what happens. Yeah. So basically I wanted to get Jake on today because he's done a lot of cool stuff and we're going to talk Africa with him. We're going to talk, uh, cellular trail cameras. We're going to talk low impact deer hunting. We're going to talk all kinds of stuff over the course of these shows. But this particular episode, I kind of wanted to challenge him. I mentioned to you guys last week that or in the last show that I want to talk about survival type stuff. And that's what Jake and I are going to discuss today. Uh, not necessarily because I think he's a great survivalist, but I do think he's a well-prepared outdoorsman. And I think that's the important thing when it comes to surviving tough situations is not necessarily um, practice at it, but being prepared and having the mental fortitude and the, the mental ability to say, I'm going to get through this. And that's something I think Jake and I are both very strong at doing. Uh, so, sir, here is the question. Of course, you can add on questions and whatnot. This is just off, off the top of my head. But the question is, or the scenario is this. It's an evening hunt. Um, let's say you've hiked in a, a good amount. We don't have maybe a mile, okay? You you hung your stand, you shot your deer, you're in the process of blood trailing the deer, you get turned around, okay? Your electronics are not working, so cell phone's dead, uh, GPS, either you don't, ha- you don't have that available to you. What do you have in your pack that's going to A, help you get out of the woods, or B, or and B, if you can't get out of the woods, what do you have on you and how are you going to use it to stay the night and stay alive? And let's just say you're not in danger of freezing to death, but you'll be really cold. All right. So let's break it up into two different questions because you're asking one, how, to, how would I survive a night if I had to? And 
two, well, I guess this is backwards. Number one, you're asking, how would I get out of the woods if I have to? And number two, you're asking, what would I do if I got stuck there for a night, correct? Yeah, so we'll just go with the, the first one. You are completely turned around. At the moment, you do not know where you're at, other than you're in a big part of National Forest land. Okay, and you need to get back to a road. You need to get back to, you know, your tree stand or, or familiar ground for safety. All right, so I'm with you. So, so to start out with, anytime I'm hunting where I'm not familiar with it, I've got, and it's in my backcountry pack, it's the front right pocket of my pack. I've got a little tracking, survival, safety, don't get lost kit. And what's in that is two really cheap flashlights, uh, three sheets of wax paper that are two inches by two inches each, a couple rubber bands. I've got uh, maybe a dozen cat eye reflectors in there and then a roll of orange reflective trail marker tape. So when I go into an area and I think I might be in there too dark, I'll stick up the cat eyes or I'll stick up the reflector tape. But once I start tracking, what I'll do is I'll take those sheets of wax paper over top of my little cheapy flashlights. And they're super, super small. I kind of get for your kid to play with. Mm -hmm. But take that rubber band them over. It kind of looks like a little lit up white lantern. Um, and what I'll do is leave those at last blood when I'm tracking. So you put one up last blood, then you start tracking. You know when that blood sparse and you get like the one or two spots and you just can't quite follow them, right? Well, at night, you've got that lantern now at the last spot instead of a cat eye or something else. And real, real thick forest, you need that light to be able to look back and see. But I'll leave that at last blood. Then I'll take the next one up to last blood with me. Then obviously, I've got a light with me. So I can always look back when I'm tracking and have a straight line view of where I came from. So that's kind of how I avoid getting lost um, tracking in the first place. Okay, so you kind of Hensel and Gretel your way along the bloodline. Yeah, if I'm alone and I don't know where, if it's unfamiliar ground, definitely. Anytime I go out west, even just a month ago, we were up in New Brunswick bear hunting. Um, and we had a situation with a bear. There wasn't a lot of blood. Uh, we had the lights on at the truck, which was like 200 yards from where the bear was shot. Um, but then get in the woods every 50 yards, you lose complete sight of any light. So we took all the flashlights, extra ones we had, hung them up in trees with that wax paper over them, and it gives you a good enough path where you can always see back through the woods and find your light. It's a lot easier to see than trail marker tape or cat eyes or anything like that. Okay, so here's my question. If, if So as you move forward, you're always bringing that back light up with you, correct? I'm what I'm always doing. So the, the last blood light, you know, it's alternating. So I'm, I'm double doubling back on myself every 50, hundred yards. If I'm by myself and I'm in a situation like we're talking about, I'm always doubling back, grabbing that last light. And I'm always keeping a straight line side of where I came from with the light. So I'm not necessarily leaving the light at like the next blood drop, but I'm leaving it as a straight line of where I came out of. And then I can mark the blood with flagging tape or cat eyes or whatever. Okay. But I'm using those things for safety to get back out. I see what you're saying. Okay. Yep. And then you know blood is there, so you could track blood out if you needed to get out. Yeah. Yeah. And quite honestly, if it's too sketchy of a situation or I don't think I made a good hit and it's going to be a long track job, I'm not even doing this at night in the first place. Right. Um. Yeah, that, that, you know, you that's get, a good way to survive get, situations is don't put yourself in them. Yeah, it's the best way to survive yeah. situations. Don't don't be in the first place. But, you know, I understand sometimes you end up there. Or sometimes, you you know, you're finding blood and you're a couple hundred yards in. And, man, a couple hundred yards can get you lost in the woods real quick when you're not familiar with it. Okay, I, that that's a good tip. I never did the I never thought of the whole lantern thing. I've uh, I've done it with chem lights before. Kind kind of the the same yeah. I, idea, you know. Um, I, I've hung. Uh, I always have chem lights with me, or w w what do non military people call them? Um, glow sticks. Glow sticks, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I was like trying to think of it. So um, it, and there's the reason I like glow sticks is if you do get in a situation where there's a search party coming to find you, you wrap one of them puppies on a rope or be a shoelace or a 550 paracord and you swing that thing around every helicopter within a, a you know state is going to see you down there you know if you can get to a clearing yep. so there, there's there's a lot of different uses for glow sticks but um 
you know, what, what you're talking about would, would work just the same um, as far as giving you a reference point to uh, piggyback your way back out. I like that. That's a good idea. Um, all right. So um, any other thoughts on this this first aspect of getting back out if you are turned around? Um, it just the only thing I would add to is if you do find yourself in that situation, don't make it worse by keep going. You know, yeah. it's, it's kind of time to get it. Question number two, you just got to hunker down and deal with what you got until daylight. I mean, it's only so much you can do trudge around the forest at night when you're not familiar with it. It is. I am so glad you said that because that would have been my answer, you know, fr- from almost the get go is you create so much more work for yourself by not taking account of your situation, which means sit down, literally sit down, clear your mind, think, because if you let all those, if you're just wandering, the panic sets in, the aggravation sets in, our egos set in because we're all a little egotistical. We all think we're the greatest outdoorsmen out there. But here's the thing. You can sit down, clear your mind, and really take in your surroundings. And you know what, what kicks in at that point? You're hearing. You're not hearing your heartbeat anymore. You're not hearing your heavy heavy breathing. You're hearing maybe the, the babbling of the brook, right? You might hear a splash in you of a deer jumping in water, and you know that water gives you a bearing of where you're at. You may hear a truck driving down a gravel road. All those things are things you are going to miss if you're just freaking out and trying to run your way out of the woods. And I'm pretty sure you would agree with that assessment. Yeah, definitely. You got to sit down and calm yourself down. And then something I've always, always done in these kind of situations, and I've been in some pretty hairy situations and in a lot of different aspects, but is, is a SWOT assessment, you know, SWOT strengths, weakness, opportunity, and threats, sit down, calm down, Think about what your strengths, your weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are in that particular circumstance, and then make your game plan around that. And if you guys haven't figured it out now, Jake and I both come from law enforcement backgrounds, but uh, and, but a lot of these mindsets do play into this type of situation. So, okay, I think we, uh, we've we answered uh, that part one. So part two, get comfortable. You're staying the night. What do you have in your pack that's going to help you survive that night? All right, guys, we are about to move on, but real quick, I just want to say we're in a brand new studio, so we're, this is only the second episode we've actually uh, recorded in here, so I'm still learning the ins and the outs and the different audio sounds and stuff, so uh, if you heard a little feedback there, a little background noise, I do apologize, I think we got taken care of. You didn't miss out on anything, we, we cut it real quick there, so I'm going to hop back into this conversation with Jake. All right, here's what's up. We are now moving on to part two of this question. You're going to stay the night in the woods. How are you going to survive this night in the woods? Are you going to be comfortable? Is that not a a worry or a goal? What do you have on you that's going to help you throughout the night? All right. So in in my hunting pack, and specifically now backcountry hunts or somewhere I'm not familiar with, in my front right pocket, I said I've got that tracking kit. My front left pocket, I've got fire, water, shelter. It's the three main things I'm going to need in a bad situation. So I've got some kind of windproof lighter, some kind of flint, and there is a backup. We either got uh, a little foldable, I don't know what it's called. I want to say now, Gene, but I know that's a hard one. It's a little plastic fold-up water. Life, like a life straw. Uh, bottle. So, no, it's it's like a bag, um, a oh. platypus bag is what it's oh, called. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, it's a Fold-up bag. It, yeah, it holds water. So it just sticks in there in case of emergency if I need to go filter water out somewhere. And there's a couple of purifier tablets in there. Um, and then paracord. I've always got a little bit somewhere stuffed in the pack. Uh, but just a small, lightweight, waterproof piece of plastic is basically what I want to keep in there. It's not even a tarp. And what I really keep it in there for is when I kill something, I can lay this plastic out on the, gap, on the ground. Like when I quarter my animal, I can use it as a clean surface to lay my quarters on before I get ready to pack out. But that doubles in the pack is having something to use for a shelter as well. Yeah. It makes total sense. I, uh, you know, in my pack, you're going to find, I've taken a, a little pill bottle and I've filled them up with, um, cotton balls that I've rubbed in Vaseline. 
Uh, it's a great little fire starter. They're tiny. You can fit about a hundred of them in there. And I have three or four mm-hmm. bit. I, I have three or four Bic lighters. It, just the cheap. I grab them at the grocery store. That yeah, they're not windproof, but you know what? They light every freaking time. And I'm only going to need it for one night. So you know, one is none. Two is not enough, and three is just right. Or there's that old saying, right? I I always have a bunch of of, of fire starters. I don't go hardcore like you with the flint and the steel and a bow press and all that stuff. I, 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 I've just, uh, luckily I've never ever had to use them, but I, I do have them at my, and I agree 100% with, with the paracord. Yeah. It's, it's so valuable. And, um, you know, I lace my boots with paracord and I have it, uh, you know, wrapped around my, um, around my tree stand for, for, uh, helps keep things quiet where your boots rub on it and stuff like that. So I, I always usually always know where I can find, you know, my pull up rope is paracord. There's always, there's so many uses for pieces of rope. So I, I agree with you a ton there. So, uh, shelter wise, what are you thinking? Just like a, a lean to style, something just, are you looking to reflect heat or just keep the water off you? What's your, what's your plan here for one night? It just depends on where I'm at. If it's not going to get too cold, I'll make something to keep heat in and keep water, moisture, dew, something like that off of me. So small fire, low to the ground shelter, something I can sit up in. I don't like to be too huddled in there if it's not not an emergency or if I don't have to be tucked in a little rabbit hole. I don't want to be tucked in a little rabbit hole. But honestly, you're probably not going to sleep much anyway. Sit up, enjoy fire try and stay dry and that's about the best you can do yeah i agree you're wait you're waiting on daylight at that point that, that's really what it's all about yep well very cool i think that hey, hey back what? oh sorry i interrupted you i'm sorry but back to the fire in, in your bic lighters yeah the only you got to be careful with bic lighters when you go start hunting out west when you finally come out there with me once you get up in altitude, if you get your big lighters here in Ohio, I'm at 700 feet, and I go out to Utah in 10,000 feet, that big lighter will not light up there. The pressurize is wrong, so it's always good to have variety in your in your fire starters. I had, have a couple different ways you can start fire. I had no clue. I, I never, I've never heard that at all. Yeah, I, I I learned that from experience, and luckily I had uh, luckily I had backups up there, but. Yeah, just the just the altitude change can, uh, especially a cheap bit, can totally render it useless. Yeah, that's that's good to know. I know uh, there's there's a whole host of things you learn when when you start moving out west. Like uh, your your coolers tend to pressurize lock. Didn't didn't that happen? To yeah, you? you you'll get. Uh, I think it was 2015, maybe I was hunting backcountry in Pavant Mountains in Utah. Um, and I could drive all the way up the mountain, which is really cool, but it was like a two hour drive to get up to where I wanted to hunt. Uh, all my food, all my water, everything I had in the cooler in the back of my Jeep. And when I got up there, I didn't get the cooler open because it pressurized so much. I actually had to drive all the way back down, crack open the lid on the cooler. When I got back down to, to I think it was 4,000 feet started and then take the drive up. So it took me six hours to drive up there, drive down and drive back just like me on my cooler. Yeah. But you'll never make that mistake again. Hey. <laughs> or have you have you invested in one of the coolers that no. have a pressure lock? No, I'm way too cheap for that. I've still got the same cheap Coleman cooler that I've had for 15 years, but I just crack it open before I drive up the mountain now. Do you even Yeti, bro? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I'm not. I'm. I, uh, I'm not knocking any products. I was just a, a joke because he said he's too cheap to buy an expensive cooler, and we're we're uh, a lot of times in, in that same boat. So that's gonna about wrap up this episode, guys. Uh, like I said, I want to keep them about twenty twenty five minutes. Hit a single topic each time. Jake, I really want to thank you for coming on the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Again, man, I appreciate it. Yeah, and guys, he's gonna be a, he's gonna be a regular guest again. He's he's one of my best buddies. I, sh- you know, if I wasn't so conceited and didn't have such an ego and have to have my name on the damn show, he probably would be the co-host. But uh, we'll we'll just we'll we'll give him we'll we'll give him preferred guest status. That way, I can kick his ass off the show anytime I actually want to. That's probably a good idea because there's gonna be a lot of Ohio State taunting coming up here as fall approaches. Yeah, it's it's not gonna be good uh, for you. <laughs> but uh for, for those of you guys a little little behind the scenes uh action here we like i said earlier we are actually video skyping and this phone call and he's holding up 
a uh, piece of paper which has the score of the U of M Ohio State game written on it from last year, which is not in my favor. Obviously, it's uh, and we went into that game as the uh, the favorited. Uh, Ohio State was an underdog at home for the first time in like a decade, and it did not work out for my Wolverines. But uh, it's okay, a great day. <laughs> Oh, so frustrating. <laughs> so, <laughs> we've literally won one game since you and I have been friends. It's like not even a rivalry. <laughs> but okay, anyway, that's probably all getting cut out of the show. But okay. Guys, I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for coming back after my hiatus. I'm really looking forward to bringing you weekly shows. This is going to be a lot of fun. And I end the show the same way every time. Hacker, take us out. Get outdoors. It's a wild place to be. He knows the, he knows the phrase, folks. He's been around before. We'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of Hoffman's Hunting Heritage. Get outdoors. It's a wild place to be.